Hey everyone, welcome to Acacia Online. We're so excited that you're joining us here on this Monday night. We can't wait for you to experience everything God has for you this evening. Wherever you are, let's plug in and worship together. Here's our gathering.
We hope that God met you exactly where you're watching this evening. In just a second, Pastor Russ is going to bring us the second installment of Who Is This Man? We want you to be involved with the sermon. Let us know if God is speaking to you. Get ready and give it up in the comments for Pastor Russ. So glad that you guys are with us today. Uh, it, is, it is an honor to have you in the house of the Lord. It feels amazing in the house. And so thank you guys for being here. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, we're in part two of a series. And if you don't mind, while I could just stand up here and love on you from afar for a long time, I do need to get right into this because I've got a lot that I need to cover but we are in uh, this second installment, as I just said, and we've kind of tied ourselves for the series to this chapter in Mark, chapter 4 of Mark, where it kind of tells the story um, of, of Jesus in the boat with some disciples. Verse, chapters 1 through 3 really have kind of, Jesus has done some things, he's taught, he, he's kind of been out in the, in the community, so to speak. And then he says, okay, guys, to the disciples, let's get in the boat. And we're going to travel to the other side because we're going to go to a new spot. And then the storm comes up and, and completely begins to take over the water, take over the boat. And we pick up in verse 35 when it says, Then Jesus got up and rebuked the wind and the sea. He said, Silence, he commanded. Be still. And the winds died down and it was perfectly calm. Why are you so afraid, he asked. Do you still have no faith? And I love verse 41 for so many reasons. Overwhelmed with fear, and a lot of times we all become overwhelmed with fear. You don't have to say amen at the, at the, because you want to sound tough, right? But, but I know that that's all of us. They ask one another, who is this? Who is this man that is so dynamic that he can speak to nature and it listens? Who is this man that has this kind of authority and this kind of power? And as I said last Sunday, this question that the disciples ask is incredibly important because it's the same question that all of us ultimately have to ask ourselves. And this, this question has radical, radical theological impl implications because your worldview depends on your Jesus view. Okay, How you see the world hinges upon how you see the Lord, how you understand the world as, as a whole. It hinges upon your understanding of Jesus. And so last week we discovered that Jesus is the way. The first point that I had last week was Jesus is the way to salvation. We read a scripture where Jesus was speaking and he said, I, I'm the only way to the Father. No, no man goes to the Father. No man comes to the Father except by me. And then the second point was Jesus is the way to sanctification because sanctification is the thing that follows salvation. So you don't just get saved and then stay where you are and the church gives me a good loud amen to that. Uh, sanctification is the process of spiritual purification. It's where the Lord is, is pulling the sin out of us, getting the old things out of us, leading us into this realm called maturity. And so I challenge you guys to realize that you can age in your faith or you can mature in your faith. But just because you age in your faith doesn't necessarily mean that you are maturing. And so that kind of sets us up for where we are going. And if you were with us last Sunday or if you watched online, you caught up online, I told you that I'm asking you to kind of see this series through some deeper theological lenses. I, I, I like to just kind of, I, I like to kind of say it like this. I am predominantly or primarily what I call like a mindset preacher, uh, an application kind of a preacher. I want to I wanna challenge the way that you think about the Lord so that you will behave differently. I don't want to try to just go about this behavior modification kind of, a, of an approach. I want you to learn to see Jesus from a different perspective. And so while I spend a lot of my time on like giving you a tool that you can have on Thursday so that when you face that proverbial fork in the road, you'll be equipped to make a good godly decision Today's installment is even a little bit deeper theologically than, than last week, especially the first half of what I'm going to present to you. And so I'm going to tell you, I, I will, I'm going to be covering some things that are, that are deeply profound, but my, my, my plea to you or my pledge to you is that 
I'm going to do the very best that I can to make these complex things seem uh, somewhat manageable so that, you can, so that you can swallow them, so that you can digest them. And, and again, I'm starting very theological, but I'm going to try to end very uh, applicational, if that makes sense at all. And one more thing before we get into the new territory. Uh, last week, we challenged you to read a chapter of the book of John each day for the rest of the month. And so there's two things going on there. Number one, you're going to be learning more about Jesus, uh, which is the point of this series. And number two, you're going to be going along with this series as we kind of walk through some information that we are learning. So last week we learned that Jesus is the way. Today we're learning that Jesus is the word. And so I want you to say that out loud with me. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus. The word. word. So let's let's look at that and, and see what that's all about. So we're going to be in the, in the Gospel of John. Uh, a lot of our, I guess you would say our primary text for today is going to be in the book of John. And it's been said like this. John chapter 1 has been said to be the most important chapter in the entire New Testament whenever it comes to what is called Christology. Christology is the, excuse me, it's the study of Jesus. It's the study of the nature of of Jesus. And so for authors and scholars and academics to say that John chapter 1 is the most important chapter in the entire New Testament whenever it comes to Christology, that's actually saying a whole lot, right? Uh, John Calvin said of the book of John on the screen, of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the, f- the first three show us Christ's body, but John shows us Christ's soul. And, and I, I love that, that the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called the synoptic gospels. It's because the word synonym, it's, it's very alike. Th- those three gospels are very alike in their approach. They're very alike in what they're, what they're trying to, to accomplish. But, but John is kind of like, it's where we put on our big boy pants. It's where we put on our big girl pants. And we, we kind of jump into some, some deeper waters from a Christology perspective, from the study of the nature of who Jesus is. And another author said it like this, of the first five verses alone, we find six incredible revelations. The eternality of Christ. We learn about the personality of Christ. We learn about the deity of Christ. We learn about the creativity of Christ. And we learn about the life that Christ gives. And we learn about the light that Christ brings. And so as you can see, all of those are are incredibly important. They're incredibly profound. So those revelations are found in our primary text that we're going to read in John chapter 1. So on the screen, let's, let's go. Let's dig in. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was God, he was with God in the beginning. And through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. That light shines into the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then jumping down to verse 14, we learn who the Word is, literally and profoundly. In verse 14, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Who is it? We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. And so, again, hold on tight. And let's look at the incredible depth and profound significance of the fact that the first thing on the screen is Jesus is the Word. And I don't have time to go into like the Greek uh, pulling through of, of, of what this word means. But in the Greek language, the New Testament was written in Greek, it just basically says Jesus is the Logos. The Logos is the Greek word there, and it basically means word, but it also means thoughts. So it means like, like how we think in words, that's, that's also what is being established here. So it, it's the word, but it's also thought. And so then that should connect you back to how I established that the worldview is important. And so what we're, what we're understanding here is our thoughts and our rationale and our worldview is tied in to Jesus. And the initial point that's being like urgently like underscored right here by John is that Jesus was fully God and yet somehow fully man. 
Somehow the Son of God becomes the revelation of God. And that fully bends our mind. It should bend your mind. Because approaching and understanding the personhood of Jesus isn't as simple as just understanding or approaching the understanding of any other ordinary person. Because the point that you're going to understand today is that Jesus was indeed no ordinary person. Is there anybody that wants to help me celebrate that real quick? Amen. So last week I mentioned how I said yes to Stephanie and we got married and whenever I said yes to Stephanie, I said yes to the, the totality of Stephanie. I said yes to, to all parts of her, the, the good, the bad, the ugly, the wonderful, the, the beautiful, all of everything. I said yes to her entire person. Well, we're 30 years into this marriage and come on, somebody, I'm still learning about Stephanie, and she is still learning about me. We'll save the details of that till next February for our relationship series. But here's the point. Understanding someone is not an immediate process. Understanding and wrapping your mind around the personality of the person that you're talking about doesn't necessarily come simply or it doesn't come easily. Yet here in Scripture, you'll see it on the screen, it says it like this from the Evangelical Study Bible. With skilled delicacy, John handles the issues of profound importance. Here, divinity and humanity, word and flesh are discussed with, I love how he says this, deceptive simplicity. And I want you to understand, I'm going to give you a lot of quotes here because this is not just an opinion that I'm sharing with you this morning. This is academically and theologically substantiated. The Holman Study Bible says it like this, Jesus was both word and flesh, not one to the exclusion of the other, which is very important for you to understand, and thus was the perfect and only God-man. And that's exactly what John 1 and 14 is clearly saying. The word became flesh. But in becoming the temporal flesh, he did not cease to be the eternal word. His divine nature was not laid aside on account of his human nature. But in becoming flesh, he still held on to that divine aspect of his being. The New International Version Study Bible says this, Jesus was God in the fullest sense, retaining all of the essential properties of the word. We go back to John 1 there again. He entered into a new mode of being, not a new being. A book called called The Theology in, in the Exodus says this, the theological term that combines the dual natures of humanity and divinity within Jesus are known as the hypostatic union, which that is basically where his two distinct natures are somehow united into one person. And I don't want you to think that I'm giving you all these quotes and we're getting, we're getting the scuba gear on and we're going into the deep end of the pool just so you can say, wow, I don't know what he's saying, but it sure sounds good, <laughs> right? I've heard some people say that about sermons. That was deep. And that means I have no clue what you said. <laughs> it's like, I think I'm supposed to have realized what you said, but that was deep, Pastor. Okay, I don't, I'm okay if it... I'm okay if not a one of you ever looks at me about a sermon and says, well, that was deep. Because I want you to say, I can use that. I can understand that. I can apply that to my life. Because see, what what we're trying, what I'm trying to get you to understand here in the first part of this message is, is Jesus was not just another itinerant preacher on the preaching circuit in the Middle East. Prophets had come before him. Preachers had come before him. People had come before him saying that they were the Messiah. People had done tricks and mystery. But Jesus was very, very different. He raised people from the dead. He healed people of blindness. He healed people of deafness. He healed people of the sickness called sin. Come on, somebody. Jesus was very, very, very different because Jesus was very, very, very divine. He was not just anybody else. He was not just an ordinary person. He was Jesus. And again, we see that divinity on display in verse 14 where it says the word or Jesus came down and made his dwelling among us. I want you to say dwelling. 
Jesus came down, the Word came down and made his dwelling among us. Now that word dwelling, a lot of times we just read right over it, but it is actually miles deep from a theological perspective. The word dwelling here in the original language is associated and has its root meaning in the words tent and tabernacle. And so the word implies an absolute literalness of God coming into humanity. And so many times what is established or what looks like is being established in the New Testament is actually rooted in the Old Testament. And so we're not going on the screen, but its literalness is rooted back in Exodus chapter 40. And so way back in the beginning, you've got Genesis. You've got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. So, So Exodus is the second book in the entire Bible. So Israel, the children of Israel, have been captive in Egypt. We sang about that. One of the songs that we sing is, is he got us out of our Egypt. He got us out of our sin. And so Egypt has been released from captivity. And you have to understand the connection here. Because God is saying, hey, you're you're out of slavery. You're out of sin. You're out of captivity. You're out of bondage. So let's figure out a way that I can dwell with you. Let's figure out a way that I can be with you. Let's figure out a way that you and I can have a relationship, how you and I can, can interact And so again, Israel is fresh out of slavery and captivity and God is setting up this this system of interaction. He's setting up this system where he can reveal himself to them. And the tabernacle or the tent is exactly what they built. God told them, make this tabernacle, make this tent. And so they built it. And that was an earthly building filled with the glory of God. And it was there that God dwelt with them. And so in Exodus, the tent was a dwelling place of God. And it was where God met his people. And it was where God would be with his people. And then comes Jesus. Matthew, the book of Matthew, calls him Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And so now Jesus is the newly revealed tabernacle. Come on. Jesus is the newly revealed tent. Jesus is the new place of God's dwelling. It's a new revelation of this invisible God. And as Pastor Blake preached to the students on Wednesday night, whenever you know who Jesus really is, then you really begin to respond to him in a different manner. When you really understand who he is and what he's done, what he's continuing to do, then our response to him changes because he's not just any other Man, he's not just an ordinary preacher. He's not just an ancient prophet. He's Jesus. He is divine. And we need to do everything that we can to learn about him and know him so that we can better follow him and be in a relationship with him. Because as I said last Sunday, it's hard for you to learn to trust somebody and be in a relationship with somebody that you do not know. And so we have to learn who is this man. So we've just skimmed the surface of his nature from a theological perspective. And and obviously, as you can tell, we could spend a year right there. You talk about a year-long series. Okay, we could we could be there for a long time, but but for time we just we just skim the surface of his nature from a theological perspective. Now let's consider his nature from what I'm just calling an applicational perspective. I don't even know if that's a word. I just made it up. Okay, applicational. So we go back to John chapter 1, jumping down a couple of verses now to verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, But I love how this one ends. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Just real quick, is anybody thankful for the grace and the truth that comes from Jesus Christ? (laughs) Man. I love this. Let me preach this. I got to hurry. All throughout Scripture... Not only does he give us words, Jesus give us words of grace and truth, but we actually see it in reality. We can see actual examples of grace and truth. This points to the importance of really knowing who Jesus is because in Jesus we see the theological implications of grace and truth. And now in Jesus, we're seeing the literal application of grace and truth. And so I want to remind you, this series is built to better help you understand who Jesus is. 
That's, that's the whole point of every word that is coming out of our mouth over the next couple of weeks and the last week. And, and, and to properly know him, you have to learn to properly balance grace and truth. Grace and truth have to work together. Let me say it like this. It's on the screen. Grace without truth would be deceitful. And truth without grace would be condemning. And so balance is the key. You parents, a perfect example is raising children. You give them discipline and you give them compassion. You give them both. I, I, I won't put this on you, Ricky Bobby, but I'll put it on me. I spanked their hides, come on somebody, and I also hugged their necks, come on somebody. I gave them both. I drew boundaries for them sometime, and in other occasions, I let them draw boundaries, but I also reserved the right to change those boundaries if I did not like them, because I was always looking out for their best interest, but it was always both. It's the same with grace and truth. It's the same with the grace and truth that Jesus both reveals and examples. Because if you want to have spiritual balance in your life, which I think all of us do, then we have to learn how to balance grace and truth. So let's talk about them real quickly. Let's first talk about grace. Again, I could spend a year talking about grace. Certainly four weeks, a series that could be on grace and barely scratch the surface. So let me just pique your interest with the next four minutes, okay? Grace is defined like this. When the free and unmerited favor of God is manifest in the pure salvation of sinners like me and like you. And, and again, I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for the grace that God has given me. I'm thankful for, for salvation. I, I've said it so many times from, from the pulpit. My pastor would always tell me, son, don't ever get over being saved. We're saved. If you're in Christ, you're saved. And grace is that free and unmerited favor of God manifest in the pure salvation of sinners like me and like you. Grace explained is when we get something that we totally do not deserve. And grace exampled is when we look at Jesus in Matthew 9 and 2. Some men brought to Jesus a paralytic lying on a mat. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. So nowhere in scripture do we read where the man earned his forgiveness. Nowhere in Scripture do we read where man earned his salvation. Nowhere in Scripture do we read where man earned his healing. It was just a gift that Jesus wanted to give. Or Luke 23, the thief on the cross. Then he said, Jesus, remember me whenever you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. He was a thief. He was getting what he should have gotten. And that was punishment because of his actions. But Jesus said, no, I'm not going to give you what you deserve. I'm going to give you something that you do not deserve. And now you know the grace aspect of Jesus. And, and now that we're called, that now that we know it, we're, we're supposed to example it, right? If you're a follower of Jesus, here's where we're going to get good, okay? You're supposed to give grace as freely as it's been given to you. Now I'm all up in your business, ain't I, Right? Right? It was all good when you preach, salvation, preach. But now you're talking about, okay, wait a minute. I got to give grace to people? Okay, let's next, you know, okay, let's, let's keep going. Okay, let me tell you the story about my, my daughter Riley. My daughter Riley was, uh, she's our youngest, and, and she got her driver's license. And, and we gave her uh, this, this, she inherited a Volkswagen Passat that had like 700 million miles on it. And so she gets in the car that first day, and Steph and I were, were living in Prairieville. And it was almost like she was like driving off to college or something. It was like in a movie. We went outside. We're standing there like arm in arm just like looking at, at, at our baby girl getting in the car. And she's fixing to go off. I don't even know where she was going. She got her license that day, and she's going to go to her friend's house or whatever. And we're like, we did it. We did it. We raised the second one, and we don't have to bring her anywhere anymore. She's going to be able to bring herself. Oh, God is good. And we're all excited, right? And we're standing there in the joy of this moment, and Riley begins to back out. And she doesn't just graze the mailbox. She takes it completely down. And she doesn't just barely take it down. Again, she, she hit the mailbox where you put the key in the trunk, y'all. So you factor in that and then where she should have been. She's a solid 10 to 12 feet off of where she should have been. And what she deserved was to get in the toddler seat in the back with mommy and daddy. But you know what she got? 
she got her insurance paid for the next several years. That's grace. That's grace. When we get something that we should not deserve. Truth, I gotta hurry. Like I could barely only present grace because of the time, I, I, I can only hit the surface of truth here, but truth is defined in a quality or a state of, in accordance with a literal fact or spiritual reality. Truth explained is whenever the, the phrase is when you call a spade a spade. Whenever you say, here's the deal. Uh, when, when LSU football begins, uh, Coach O always talks about tell the truth Monday. They'll sit around, they'll look at the game film, and they won't, they won't put sugar on it. They'll, just, they'll, they'll, they'll tell the truth. They'll, they'll, they'll say it just like it is. Truth example is when we hear Jesus say in 20, Matthew 23 and 13, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door on the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, and you don't even enter in yourself, nor will you let those who are, who are trying enter in. In other words, you speak one way, but you live another. And sometimes you need to be called out on the way that you're living your life versus the way that you are claiming to live your life. Matthew 5 and 29, Jesus is speaking and says, If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body be thrown into hell. Somebody needs to look at you and say, It would be better if you couldn't see it all versus you looking at the things that you were continuing to choose to look at. I could give you 50 more passages, man, about all of these different things, but I'll just jump down to, I remember the first time that this ever happened. Uh, to me, someone really told me the truth. I was probably, I don't know, probably 10 years old. I was playing soccer. And I was convinced that I was God's gift to humanity from the, realm, from the world of soccer. I was the best. There was nobody close. I was, I, I, my, my, my confidence was, was, was solid, okay? And, and we're in the car one time, and I'm in the car with Aunt Winona and my cousin Brent. And I continue to just tell them about how good I am and how I'm going to dominate practice. And it's going to be fantastic in every way. And... My Aunt Winona convinced to uh, tell me things. <laughs> right? She said, you know, you're not the only man on the team. You're, you're, you're not the only person on the team. And I remember how that felt. I remember the sting of someone telling me the truth. And I could give you so many more examples of leadership coaching that I've been through, professors that have called me out on things, pastors and preachers that have called me out on things. Hearing the truth was the healthiest possible option. Hearing the truth is the healthiest possible option. Not in the moment, because we don't like how it feels. But it helps us so much going forward. And when you learn how to really live this out, then you'll understand more about Jesus. And I've got to hurry. I, I, I was going to I was going to spend some some more time here on this, but I don't. I, I really don't have time to go into it. But in in the book of John, chapter eight, is it, one of my favorite stories, especially in reference to this whole concept that I'm bringing to your attention now. But this woman had been caught in the act of adultery, and and the religious professionals of the town get her and they bring her to Jesus. Jesus is teaching. They bring her and and they just said, Hey, the law of God says that we should stone her right now. That she should she should be killed right now. That's death penalty. That's what she deserves. But what do you say we should do, master? What do you say we're supposed to do? Scripture says that Jesus leans, leans down and he's writing in the dirt. And then suddenly he just, he just says, okay, I got a plan, guys. All you rock holders right now, the first one of you that is without sin, you're welcome to start the rock throwing party. You, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. You, who's, you, you, you who are perfect, you, you, you just let her have it. And the Bible says that everybody in the circle began to drop their rocks and walk away because they knew that they were sinful. Now, John chapter 8, verse 10, Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are your accusers? Where are they? Has anyone con condemned you? No, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Leave that up there while I close. Listen. Jesus gave grace, and Jesus gave truth. Because he said, I don't condemn you either, but don't stay down there. I don't, I, I'm not kicking you while you're down, but won't you let me help you up? I, I'm not, I'm not going to cast stones at you, but I tell you what, it would be really good if you would leave your life of sin and start walking more towards me. So do you see the balance that is being presented here? 
He offers her grace, but he also challenges her with truth. He forgives her of her failure, but he lifts her up and he lifts her forward. He calls her out on the offense, but he inspires her with this thing called hope. Because he is grace and he is truth. That's who Jesus is. He is He is divine. And whenever you realize his divinity, it changes how you respond to him. And he is grace. And not only do you receive that grace that comes from him, but we're called to to give that grace to other people. And he is truth. Because he didn't save you to where you could just stay in your sin. He saved you to pick you up out of your sin. So we talked about sanctification last week. It's the process of growing. It's the process of maturing. It's the process of you saying, Lord, get the stuff out of me that should not be because I want to know more about you so that I can follow you closely and follow you better. Acacia, that was an amazing word from Pastor Russ. Now we've got some next steps for you. If this was your first time watching with us this evening, we'd love for you to click the link in the comments below to fill out a digital connect card so that we can start a conversation with you. One of our cultural values here at Acacia is that we practice generosity. If you'd like to partner with us, you can click the give link in the comments below to help support the mission, vision, and culture of Acacia Church. Thanks so much for being with us this evening. We'll see you next week.